Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here to listen to me today. I want to talk about how right after university I massively failed and how that failure in a startup taught me everything uh, that I needed to know to do my current job. So I feel very lucky with my current job. It's a job I love. I work as an investment banker. I get to go and advise companies on mergers and acquisitions. I raise financing uh, for new technologies. My competitors keep me busy by stealing my clients, and I have to steal them back so I never get <laughs> bored. Um, but all of this uh, started when I joined that industry uh, around 2000. Then the tech bubble burst, and the team I was in went from 55 people to three. So I survived one of the most massive culling in the industry, and in terms of getting in and surviving in the industry, I think everything that I learned happened at a startup many, many years earlier, and that particular startup had failed, and those were the lessons that provided me with everything I needed to know. So maybe then we go all the way back and we think about my startup. When I left university, my dad, like any good German father, wanted to be for a big German corporate. Oh, he would cut out these ads. BMW is looking for somebody. Robert Bosch. <laughs> Who else did he like? Siemens. And then almost with religious favor, he would bring me, Mercedes Benz is looking for auditors. <laughs> to him, that was the ultimate. Be an auditor at Mercedes Benz. I had no ideas of doing any of that. I wanted to go and uh, change the tech world in my own way. So I joined a voice recognition startup. I owned 25% of this company, and I was hooked on, uh, on owning part of the equity and on doing my own thing. I had four software engineers working for me and rather arrogantly, we thought we were the best coders in the world. Um, we wrote a package, it was the world's first commercial voice recognition package. I'm actually gonna show you a brief video of me as a 21 year old demonstrating this package uh, in the National Exhibition Center in Birmingham in front of several thousand people. What you'll see me do is you'll see me talking to a mic, and you'll see the computer doing what I tell it to do. Now, this is the mid-90s, long before Siri came around and did stuff on your iPhone for you. So let's have a quick look at this video and then, then talk a bit about that, that startup. Switch to demo. Hello, computer. Hello. It's a very nice day in cyberspace today. What can I do for you? I want to write a letter. Dear sir. Thank you for your letter of the 20th of June, full stop. We will be able to deliver the 10 Shakespeare speechwriters per your requirements, full stop. Next paragraph, the motif you requested is as follows, colon, next paragraph, move down, move down, Oops. move down, what's the time? Did you like that? Yeah? To medical. Magnesium prescription. Okay, so what I wanted to show here is if we can leave this up, yeah? I said, did everybody hear me? I don't know, I don't know if it's was I said magnesium prescription. If there's any doctors in the audience, it's something I made up this morning. Yeah? So it's, it's nothing real, right? So I said magnesium prescription, and this whole paragraph came out. It came out, you know, you should dilute in a glass of lukewarm water and all, all this, you know, how you should take it, when you should take it, uh, possible side effects and keep out of reach of children, and it automatically comes out the printer. Now that's faster than that doctor can scribble something unreadable. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now just to show you a, a few more things. Um, once, once you've got, uh, say, doctors, they're my pet topic today, I don't know why, hope I'm not getting ill. Once you've got doctors doing this, you can teach them discharge letters. Take notes, normal breathing, slight temperature, do not refer, one week. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, in a really short, just going bang, 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 out comes all those standard paragraphs and the patient's discharged much, much quicker than All right, that was me in love with my own technology at age 21, demonstrating what I still think today, 15 years later, was incredibly cool, that you could talk and the thing did what you wanted. Now, as you heard in my preview, ultimately it didn't work, and I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about that. 
and uh, about the journey from uh, the startup to investment banking. So what did, what did we have? Wanted to just quickly uh, talk about the things that we had and then how that worked. So we had a dream and a vision. We wanted to do voice recognition and clearly as you saw that the product actually worked. Technical knowledge, we had heaps of that. The four of us had studied artificial intelligence. It was the early days of artificial intelligence, so we actually kind of knew what we were doing. The ultimate uh, kind of benefit of that that we ended up seeing was we had this gentleman show up one day and he say, I work for Her Majesty's government. And we said, that's great. He said, I'd like to talk to you. And we were like, that's, yeah, we're always happy to talk. And he said, but you need to sign this first. So we look at this piece of paper which basically said, if you talk about anything we talk about today, we will shoot you. So I look at that and I'm intrigued, I'm feeling like James Bond. So we signed this and he whisked us off to, to Northern England to this bunker where they had 30 PhDs doing the same thing we were doing in secret for other applications. And they asked our advice and I thought, wow, we're 21 years old and they think we know what we're doing. So we had lots of technical confidence, we had maybe too much, we had lots of energy and we had a, we had a sense of purpose. What we did not have was experience, none whatsoever. And in particular on the business side we had none, so we ended up failing. So just to, uh, just to go through a little bit about why we failed, there's four or five main reasons. The first main reason is there was no market. RSI, does anybody know what RSI stands for? Okay, I just proved my point. Repetitive strain injury, one individual knows. So repetitive strain injury is when you type uh, and uh, you use your arm a lot, your sinews don't work anymore, it's very, very painful and you can't move your fingers anymore. Back in the late 80s, thousands of call center operators were getting it and business were being sued and people were very worried about using keyboards. Keyboards were evil. Well, we have genetically evolved. All you guys are WhatsApping so much that your sinews are actually retrained, nobody gets RSI except professional tennis players. If you then, uh, the second point I guess is people learn to type. Back in the late 80s when my, my father was working, not to use him as too much of an example, he would dictate, his assistant would type, they'd mark it up, he'd dictate some more. If I went to my assistant and said, could I dictate something to you please? She'd look at me like I'm doing a bad joke and tell me to get back to work. So people learn to type, everybody knows how to type. The next point, which is a little bit unfortunate, is one potentially huge market for us was the disabled market. And I, I did take one call from one of our disabled clients that haunts me today. This young gentleman called me. He was paralyzed from the neck down. He could only move his head. And he said, your systems changed my life. And I was listening to the change of life. And the change of life he described was not moving his computer around, it was not doing graphics or dictating. What it was was they had been wired up to his room and he could turn on the lights, but he could lock his door. And he said, I'm 25 years old. As much as people try to respect me, they barge in and out of my room. And for the first time in my life, I have privacy because I can say lock door and the door locks. He cried. I think I cried. And that was that. Those moments were very touching and we had a lot of those. Unfortunately, uh, the disabled market does not have a lot of money. There was a very harsh economic reality uh, for me as a 21 year old to learn. Uh, even if you're doing a lot of good, it doesn't necessarily end up paying the bills. Um, the, the next thing that kind of happened was my business partner, who owned 75% of the firm, decided to take on some venture capital money. And the venture capitalists, in their wisdom, decided to push us into the mass market. So as opposed to saying, selling big systems for hundreds of thousands of dollars, the one you saw me demonstrate, we were charging $100,000 for it, wanted to sell it for $39.99. Selling something for $39.99 is very tough. It's not a technical sale. And the reason, the day that really got driven home to me is I went to a big US super store to see how our $39.99 product was placed. And I walked in and there were these footprints on the floor, so I followed those footprints. And they took me to the shelf, and the shelf was done by an accounting software company. said, you follow the footsteps all the way here, buy my accounting product. Now, these guys are geniuses. They made me walk all the way to their shelves. We would have never thought of, about that. We were totally out of our league when it comes to marketing uh, products to the mass market, so we didn't know what we were doing, and we had no funding for it. Okay. 
So what was the cost of failing? The cost of failing uh, for me was actually quite high. I was in this company for four years. When it failed, I was about 24 years old. And my health suffered. I got a rash on my whole body, uh, everywhere except my face and hands. I could wear a suit, people couldn't see it. But I, I basically developed this massive rash from stress. I, uh, money, uh, I guess, uh, similar to the gentleman this morning, I had kind of gambled it. I had borrowed huge amounts of money to fund this business. Uh, back in the mid-90s, you saw the presentation earlier, very expensive to run a business. And I owed huge amounts of money, in particular to friends. Owning money to friends is a sure way to end a friendship. Uh, and so I struggled with that, but I paid back every cent. It took me three years to do that, but I, I paid back every cent. Um, I had some irrational fears, and I kind of lost the big dream. So, so that was all a big shame. Now, would I do it again? Absolutely. And there's a, there's a couple of big reasons for it. The main one is everything that I learned that helps in my current job, I learned in those four years. I learned to sell. If we didn't sell, we didn't eat. I learned to own. That's kind of very clear. I couldn't say, oh, that's not my job. Everything was your job. I learned to organize, I learned to motivate. The motivate in particular is very key. In my current job, the guys that work for me are well paid. It's easy to motivate them. When people are making almost no money and you're they're working for the promise of future riches and those riches don't look that near, it's actually pretty hard to motivate them. So motivation was a big thing. And I learned to work hard, which is actually crucial. Um, then. What I now wanted to do briefly, I talked a bit about investment banking, I talked a bit about the startup, I wanted to just talk a bit about the differences between the two. So, investment banking, money, startup, no money. It's kind of very obvious, I make a good salary now. When I was in a startup, we had literally no money. I lived in a bed sit, which is an English way of saying a hole with a bed. You can sit on the bed. This bedsit had a coin-operated electricity meter and a coin-operated heater. If I had one coin, I, could, I would use it for the electricity and I would code in the cold. So cold showers and coding is all I did. I remember one evening I was rummaging under the bed because I had no more money and I found 20 pence. 20 pence was enough to go to the fish and chip shop to buy a portion of chips with no fish. Um, which brings me to my next point. In investment banking, we get food. In a startup, there is no food. My wife thinks I get too much food now. You compare uh, me with the earlier video, but uh, that was an important point. Um, in investment banking, I get to sleep in a hotel when I travel. Uh, we slept in the car when we were in the startup. I remember one very interesting situation where the bank called us on Monday and said, your overdraft's far too big. You're going to give us 10,000 pounds on Friday or we're shutting you down. So, uh, bankers, I hate them, Frank. So, uh, we had one good sales lead for a bank, uh, interestingly enough, up in Scotland. So, we got in a car in, in a broken old Ford Fiesta. We drove it up to Edinburgh. We slept in the petrol station car park in freezing temperatures, uh, the two of us. We then went into the petrol station uh, toilet, shaved, put on a suit, and took a taxi to make it look like we had only just stepped off a plane and we were very successful. We did a whole song and dance, um, and uh, they believed it. And we then said to them, we can pick only one bank, but we need $10,000 for you to secure this deposit. They gave us the 10,000 uh, pounds. We raced back down, we saved the company, and we ate fish and chips. So that, uh, that was kind of a very adrenaline-inducing situation and uh, kind of something we lived for. Um, in an investment bank, we have pretty good infrastructure. My bank is in a very fancy tall building. We're on the 88th floor. It looks very intimidating. In the startup, I was the chief toilet cleaner. <laughs> and what I mean by that is we used to do these sales demos in our office. In those sales demos, I had this theory, if, if it, everything goes well, and they have to go, uh, like tourists, for a number one, <laughs> and the toilet is dirty, they won't buy. Not buying means coding in the cold with no fish. So I, uh, I would be there at 3 a.m. scrubbing that toilet. I had uh, that system all down pat, and so every morning at 3 a.m. after my coding was done or not done or taking a break, I would be the chief toilet cleaner. 
Um, in, in an investment bank, I'm actually lucky to work in one where there's not too much politics, but in my organization there's 50,000 people in many geographies and many titles, so there's a certain amount of <coughs> politics. In, in a startup, it was much more like a family. In fact, probably my, my best friendships and relationships after I paid everybody back uh, are from, from that time. The, the final thing I, I wanted to say was uh, extremely hard work. I think in the startup, we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, investment banking, rightly or wrongly, is, is very similar. I, I, I do, just to give one investment banking hardship story, which will sound silly, um, but I remember in, in the early days, I, I would have these debates with myself if I was getting only one hour of sleep. Should I cut my toenails or sleep an extra five minutes? And, I opted for the extra five minutes of sleep because I figured nobody saw my toenails. Um, so the, the fundamental story I wanted to say was it's extremely hard work in both. Now to bring it to the punchline before my time is up here, what, what's my message here? My message here is, is you heard earlier that you can start a startup with much lower risks if you pick a defined time, a defined amount of money, go and have an adventure. That's it.